Uh, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really honored to be here. This is uh, like Dr. Jones. It's my first visit to the Philippines. We've been treated wonderfully, and uh, I hope we'll be invited back sometime. Uh, you know, the, the only one thing I want you to know about me, uh, Mr. Rentoy gave me a very nice introduction. <clears throat> but the main thing I want you to know about me is that I was a classroom teacher like so many of you are for 36 years. Um, I started before most of you were born. Um, raise your hand if you were born after 1965. After 1965, that's a lot of you. Okay, well that was the year that I started teaching, in 1965, and I taught for a long time. I taught until the year 2001. So after 36 years in the classroom, I've been in rehab for the last 12 years. That was a joke. Okay, <clears throat> not really. I've been, uh, about six years before I stopped teaching, I started speaking, and then I continued speaking afterwards. And uh, I had a wonderful time in my teaching career, and my mission now is one thing, and that is to share with other teachers the most valuable things I learned during those 36 years in a classroom. Now before we start, I want to tell you one little story. If you teach for 36 years, you have lots and lots of stories. In fact, there's a chapter in my book that many of you uh, already have. It says, good teachers tell good stories. It's one of the most powerful teaching tools that you will ever have is to tell good stories. Anybody of any age will listen to a good story. So I want to tell you <coughs> uh, a, a story about what in the United States we call staff development days. And I understand that you call them here faculty development seminars or faculty development days. Is that correct? Yes? Okay. The, the kids get the day off and they bring in some expert and that expert tells you how to be a better teacher, right? Okay, well, in 36 years, we probably averaged four staff development days a year, so I literally sat through uh, way more than 100 of these things, and I mean in all honesty, about 99% of them were horrible. They would bring in somebody who claimed to be an expert. They called them a consultant. We called them insultants. <clears throat> uh, they kind of put us down and talked down to us like they were lofty, you know, and knew more than us, and they hadn't been in a classroom for, for years. And anyway, this went on and on and on. It was just horrible. I want to tell you a story about my last year in teaching was 2000-2001. And our vice principal announced that we were going to have this incredible consultant that was going to help us all become more effective teachers and he was going to talk about some new theory of research or something like that and so the kids had the day off and we came in uh, the next morning <clears throat> our school was built in 1958 and they had never made any improvements in what we call our multi-use room okay and we were sitting on hard metal chairs for the whole day. Uh, you know, the first thing I always look at when I come in to a room to speak, the first thing I look at is the chairs. And I even sit down in the chair so I know what you're feeling when you sit down. Because I learned a long time ago that the mind can absorb only what the fanny can endure, right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so anyway, this, uh, this consultant... Uh, he came out and he started off in the morning and he got off to a very slow and a very bad start with us. And so people were starting to tune him out already and we were hoping he would get better. But he didn't get better, he got worse as the day went along. And it was one of the most deadliest days of my entire teaching career. So finally, at 3 o'clock, it ended, the agony ended. All right, and so I went home, and that was a Monday. <clears throat> I came back on Tuesday morning, and I went into uh, 
what we call the teacher's workroom where all the teacher's mailboxes are. And I, it was uh, probably about 7.15 in the morning. The first class was at 8. <clears throat> and I was reaching up to take some mail out of my mailbox and I felt an elbow in my side here. And I looked down and it was a woman that I teach with. Her name is Jan. And she was a social studies teacher like I was. And, and I said, uh, good morning, Jan. I said, how are you? And she looked at me. And she kind of rolled her eyes and she said, oh, Hal. She said, that's my name. I wasn't saying the other H-E-L-L, H-A-L. She said, she says, oh, Hal. She said, you know, if life was fair, we would get to pick both how and when we die. It's 7.15 in the morning on a school day. I, don't, I have no idea what she's talking about. And so I figured she's leading up to something. And I said, okay, Jan, I'll bite. I said, if life was fair and we got to pick how and when we die, how would you choose? And she said, oh, that's easy. I would die right in the middle of a staff development day. <clears throat> and I said, why would you want to go out that way? And she said, because that way I would be guaranteed that the transition between life and death would be subtle. Okay, so anyway, that's my story about uh, uh, staff development days. And now that I'm on the other side, I hope people don't say that about me. Okay, let, uh, let's see, we want to go to uh, <clears throat> my slides, right? You don't want to just look at me. I'd rather have you look at the screen. Okay, there we go. All right. Now, I was asked to, uh, to present about uh, the book that I wrote in 2008. I had been speaking for a long, long time, but usually my presentations are one hour, two hour, and so on, and I can't possibly cover all of the things that I learned or the best things I learned in 36 years in the classroom. And so uh, several people asked me to put it all in writing, and I'm now very glad that they did that. And so these, of, of all the things I learned in the book, are the 20 best things uh, that, that I want to pass on to other people. Now, I won't be able to cover all 20 today, but I'll cover about 10 or 11 of them as, as, long, as, we, uh, uh, as long as I don't talk too long about a particular subject and we, and we move along. So anyway, the, the name of the book is, is uh, Lessons from the Classroom. And as many of you have it in front of you, the subtitle is 20 things good teachers do. Okay, now, uh, that's what the book looks like. As I, I think all of you have probably seen it. Uh, before we get too far in here, I want to ask one favor of you, okay? <clears throat> first things first, I want to ask you to honor the copyright laws. W will you all do that for me? Okay, because in the United States, when I say that, it makes teachers feel very uncomfortable because I ask them, do you know which profession most frequently violates the copyright laws? And they start laughing uncomfortably. Maybe you guys are the same. I don't know. But anyway, let me explain something about, about this book. <clears throat> I am the author of it, but I'm also the publisher of it. Okay. So this is what it says on the copyright page. It says, all rights reserved. Written permission must be secured from the publisher. In order to reproduce, in order to copy or reproduce any part of this book. But if you are a teacher, you may copy anything you want. Okay, so, <clears throat> so you, you have my permission now. You all heard me and I'm being recorded. So it's on record. You, uh, somebody in the United States said to me, oh, that's so wonderful. Why do you do that? And I said, because they're going to do it anyway. I might as well give you permission, <laughs> right? Okay, so we got that all taken care of. Do feel free to uh, copy anything. <clears throat> okay, lesson number one in the book is good teachers share one special quality. Now, I know if you don't have the book in front of you, what you're wondering is, what is the quality? And number two, do I have it? So let me give you the quality, and then you ask yourself if you have it. Okay? And they're all a little crazy. You have to be a little crazy to go into the teaching profession, right? Okay, now, 
As you probably know, we can use, a lot of words have more than one definition. And if I get angry at somebody and because somebody's speaking nonsense and, and I say, you're crazy, that means they're a little bit off mentally. But that isn't what I mean here. I don't know if you use the expression in the Philippines or not, but sometimes when a man and a woman fall in love with each other, and I remember my wife told me this when we were going out early, she said, I'm just crazy about you, okay? And I loved hearing that. That was a very positive thing. Okay, so how are teachers crazy? They're crazy about their jobs. The best teachers are the ones that love their jobs. Okay, I want to share with you an, uh, something that happened to me early in my uh, preparation of my teaching career. It says, my first assignment in graduate education. Okay, in California where I live, in order to become a teacher, you go to four years or however long it takes you to get a bachelor's degree and you major in whatever you want to major in, there is no such thing as an education major. <clears throat> so I majored in history, I minored in philosophy. Then if you want to become a teacher, then you go back to college for one year uh, of graduate work in education, and that's all you do for a whole year is take education courses and you do your practice teaching and, and so on. So that's the way we become teachers in California. And I was in my very first a teacher education class it had about 30 students I had a wonderful professor and he gave us a fantastic assignment to start us out on preparing to be a teacher okay uh, this is what he did he simply gave us a piece of paper and he said I want you to do something that should be very easy he said make a list of the best teachers that you have ever had and somebody asked him, well, how far back do we go? And he said, go back as far as you want to. Okay, well, I had been uh, going to school for 16 years, all right? And I <clears throat> went all the way back to my elementary school. I went to a Catholic school, the Sisters of Mercy, my teachers. Do we have any Sisters of Mercy in here? Okay, because I was going to tell you, I'll get even with you later. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> But anyway, I got a very good education there, and there were some of them that I remembered very, very fondly. And I had some high school teachers that I really loved, and I had some college professors I really loved. So by the time I was finished, I had about 15 or 20 uh, teachers, and it was a, a nice memory experience writing down these teachers that you liked so much and that had a big influence uh, on your life. So my classmates did the same thing, and then the uh, professor said, okay, everybody has their list of your best teachers. And we said, yes. And he said, okay, here's part two. And he asked this question, what do they all have in common? And so other in other words, I looked at my list of 15 or 20 teachers and asked, what do, what do all of these people uh, have in common? And it was very easy for us as a group of 30 education students, it was very easy us, for us to agree on what the answer was. This is what we decided the answer was. It was enthusiasm, all right? And that's a wonderful word, enthusiasm. Whenever I think about it, I always think uh, it's contagious. It rubs off on other people. If you're enthusiastic about what you're doing, then uh, your students will catch that enthusiasm and they will be more uh, anxious to learn uh, from you. I still remember the very last classroom teacher that, that I ever had. I may have another one someday because I still like to take courses and so on. But I had this professor at Stanford University when I was doing postdoctoral work. And it was a psychology class and his name was Jeffrey Wildfogel. And he was one of the best teachers I've ever had and he started every single class the same way. He would come out, he had a big smile on his face and he would say, oh, you guys are going to love what we're going to learn tonight. And he made us excited. It's like, bring it on, start teaching us. And, but he said the same thing every night, but he, uh, yeah, it was a night class. He said the same thing every night, but, but he believed it. And, and he made us believe it. And it was so much fun. And we learned so much from, uh, from this man. You know, one of, the, one of the subjects I taught, was United States history, among other things. I taught psychology, I taught government, 
and a whole bunch of things. But imagine how different it would be if, if I was going to teach a unit on our first president, George Washington, who I'm sure you've all heard of before, and I came out and I looked at the class and said, good morning, we're going to learn about George Washington today. <clears throat> Not the same, as opposed to me getting really excited about George Washington. So it's enthusiasm, and, it, and as I say, it is contagious. Now, Albert Schweitzer was one of the greatest human beings I've ever read about. And he says, if you love what you are doing, you will be successful. <clears throat> now, in education, in teaching, there are two types of enthusiasm. So let me talk a little bit about each one of them. The first one is for the kids themselves. Uh, I absolutely loved kids. I was a high school teacher and I love teenagers. A lot of people don't. A lot of people are afraid of teenagers. A lot of people think they're horrible. I didn't. I love them. I love the energy that they had. They were fun to be with and they energized me. And <clears throat> so that was the first thing. And I loved them from the start and I loved them uh, to the end. Now, what, what I have on the screen up here or what my professor at the University of San Francisco, he called these educational proverbs. I don't know who said them, but they have a lot of wisdom packed into them. If you can reach them, you can teach them. And what reach means if you can connect with your students. Good education is all about relationships. If you have good relationships with your students, they will uh, obviously be closer to you and they will be more likely to, uh, to learn from you. And I remember I've been asked many times in interviews, what do you think was your greatest strength as a teacher? And for me, that's very easy to answer. It was my ability to connect with kids. And I was able to connect with them because I liked them so much. Um, I don't know why, but I, not very many, but I, did teach with some people who didn't seem to like kids. Boy, they picked the wrong profession, didn't they? I, I, I remember, what, uh, this is more than once that I heard this. I had been teaching for, you know, about 30 years, and I would hear somebody much younger than me say, oh, those kids, they have so much energy. They just drain me. <laughs> you know what drain means? means pull out. That isn't about, that isn't what uh, energy does. Energy transfers to another person. It energizes, it energizes us. And that's what the kids did for me. They, they energized me. All right. So, and then the second one is kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They do want to know that you care about them. Again, it has to do with having a good relationship uh, with them. One of the, the worst things I ever heard kids say about another teacher is that a teacher was mean. Once you develop the reputation of being mean, you'll never be able to connect with, uh, with kids. And there are much better ways of dealing with kids, even when they act out in a way that we don't want them to. You don't have to be mean, but I'll get into more of that as I uh, make my presentation. <clears throat> but they didn't care where I went to college. They didn't care how many degrees I had. They just wanted to know, did I care about them? So that's the first one for the kids themselves. And the second one is for teaching itself. You have to, you have to really like doing that. You really have to like teaching them. By the way, when I use teacher, I'm talking about principals and vice principals and counselors and anybody that works at the school, we are all teachers. Okay, the second one. <clears throat> has to do for teaching itself, and there is research. There is a ton of research that proves that a student will learn more from an enthusiastic teacher than one without enthusiasm. And I remember when I was writing the book, I really found it enjoyable to read these studies. And, and the one that summarized it the best is the one that you see in front of you. Among teacher variables, enthusiasm has the most powerful and positive impact on student learning. This woman that wrote this, she did a research project at the University of Michigan when she was working on her PhD. And this is a conclusion they came to and then she's now an education professor at Rutgers University in uh, New Jersey in the United States. Okay, so that's 
That's it. You, all, you have to be a little crazy. You have to love kids. You have to love what you're teaching, and that will take you, uh, <clears throat> take you a long way. All right, now, the second one, and I'll be pretty brief on this, but I think really good teachers have two important goals. And here's the first one, high standards and character. Uh, we have too many people, at least in the United States, who forget that this is an important part of education. They just think that the only thing that we need to worry about with our kids is to have high test scores. And, and it's created an enormous number of problems in our educational system at home. It's because they don't understand the whole picture. We're educators, we want to educate the whole person, not just the brain. All right, so high standards in character to me goes first, and high standards in academics comes along with it. And, and we already know, well, I've got a, uh, I'll, I'll give you a research uh, finding in just a second here, but for those of you who are not real familiar with the concept of character education, you might ask, well, what really is it? Okay, and, and it is dealing with both the development of a child's character and it is also dealing with, with academics. They, the, as I say, they go together. Now, there are many good definitions of character education. The one that I have always used is it's bringing out the best in our kids. The, every kid that comes into our classrooms has a capacity for both good and bad, as we know that just as we do. Our job is to find the good in those kids and to help them see the good and to help bring it out, bringing out the best in our kids. Okay, I use a lot of quotations. There's a chapter in the book that says, uh, good teachers use the power of quotations. And I think they're very valuable uh, teaching tool. Now, I don't think you could use quotations with kindergarten or first grade students, but when they get a little bit older and understand, you can really teach them a lot through the power of quotations. And we have millions of them of very, very brilliant people throughout the ages who have told us very wise things. All right, I want to give you six people and I want to do it historically. So I'm going to go all the way back to the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle, who was also an educator. <coughs> And he said, educating the mind, test scores, without educating the heart is no education at all. And I support that idea 100%. Horace Mann may be a person you have not heard of before. Horace Mann is considered the father of public education in the United States. When schools first started in the United States, only the children of wealthy people could uh, go to school. They were, all of the schools were private and you had to pay to send your kids to private school. And Horace Mann thought that was not democratic. He said we're supposed to be a democratic society. Education should be available to everyone. And, and he was an incredibly courageous uh, and forward-thinking man. He says develop character first. He says then comes reading, writing, and arithmetic. Theodore Roosevelt was one of, uh, another one of our presidents. He was the president around the year 1900, around that time. And he says to educate a man in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. C.S. Lewis is a very famous uh, Christian writer and he wrote other things that were not associated with faith, but a brilliant, brilliant writer. Uh, he said education without values as useful as it is, seems rather to make man a more clever devil. And sadly, we have too many clever devils around the world, don't we? Okay. <clears throat> Martin Luther King Jr., I'm sure you've heard of him, a, a great civil rights leader from the United States. Intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that is the true goal of education. And finally, this was just said about three or four years ago. Margaret Spellings was the Secretary of Education in the United States. And she said, education at its best should expand the mind and build character. Again, they go together. So hopefully I've given those of you who are not familiar with character education a bit of an example of uh, what it's all about. Again, they're not separate from each other. They always go together. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the conclusions about what character education does for the academic part of a school. 
A growing body of research supports the notion that high quality character education can promote academic achievement. Now the, the key words in that quotation are high quality. There are a lot of people, at least in the United States, who say they have a character education program, but they're actually doing some pretty silly things. And they need help from people like Tom Lacona and others who travel around the country um, and help them uh, develop a, a solid program. Okay. Number three, good teachers form a partnership with parents. You know, when I went through teacher training, as good as it was, they never once mentioned anything about parents. And so when I started my teaching career, I thought, well, the parents have their responsibility at home, and I have my responsibility with the kids at the school, and there's not, not anything in between us. Not, we're not connected in any way. But the longer I taught, the more I got involved with parents. And it's a very simple thing that teachers can do. You contact the parents. As I say, it all begins with an invitation. Uh, you'll see this chapter in the book, and you'll see the copy of a letter that I sent to the parents. And I told them a little bit about myself, my background. I told them a little bit about uh, my approach to teaching. I said I will teach academic subjects and I will teach life lessons also. I told them that I was involved in something called character education and that I would hope that I could contribute to the development of good character of their, uh, of their children. I gave them my contact information. I said, please be, feel free to contact me at any time. I want to be your partner. And I told them, you are the most important teacher that your child will ever have. And I want to be a secondary teacher and come in and be, and be your partner. And there were so many parents that said to me that, that they had never heard from a teacher before, that teachers kind of sent the message, stay away. I did not want them to stay away. I told them they could come and watch me teach any time, or they could contact me and, and make an appointment and see me. And uh, <clears throat> I got wonderful cooperation. Uh, from parents. They don't all want to be involved, but many of them do. But it, again, it all starts uh, with the invitation. <clears throat> okay, now, I'm going to talk about, for probably the next 15 or 20 minutes, the two most important things I ever did in my 36 years of teaching. And I did both of them on the first day of school. <clears throat> so, I know you're well into your uh, school year and so you may not want to do these until next year or you may want to try to work them into your system now that's really up to you we're all we're all a little bit different but these are the two most important things that I ever did now I, I believe um, Harry Wong was here last year wasn't he and you remember hearing him okay Harry Wong says something in his book the first days of school that I quote in my book and he said is in the first days of school you will either win or lose your students and I agree with that 100 percent and I want to win my students in the first couple of days and so I want to explain to you uh, what I did okay so we're going to talk now about the first day of school and my question is what do most teachers do now you may or may not be one of these teachers that does this, but I want to tell you what 95% of the teachers that I worked with, what they did. And the, and the only reason I know is because the students told me what all of the teachers did the same thing on the first day of school. Okay, this is what they did. The first thing, they made a seating chart. They've got all the desks in rows, and they seat everybody alphabetically. They all do that for, in the... Uh, in the first day. The second thing they do, they hand out the rules. And the rules are, if you do this, this will be the punishment. If you do this, this will be the punishment. You must do this, because if you don't, this will be the punishment. And then they not only hand them out, but they read them and give a big lecture about the rules. Okay, then the third thing they do, and I was a high school teacher, they hand out a sheet of paper that says <clears throat> what the requir course requirements are, how you get a certain grade, how much homework there will be, how many tests there will be, how many assignments there will be, what you're expected to do. And it's all on paper, and then the teacher lectures about it also. 
And then the last thing the teacher does is hands out a description of the course material that will be covered in the semester. And again, gives a big lecture on it. And this whole thing takes the full first day, which is 50 minutes. And that's all they do on the first day. And everybody's doing the same thing. And every kid says the first day of school is the worst day of the year. That it's deadly boring. Okay. I think there's a, something more important than we can do. Harry Wong says you're going to win or lose them in those first few days of school. If you do that on the first day of school, you're going to lose them right then. All right. So let me explain what I learned uh, to do. <clears throat> Chapter 4 in my book is entitled, Good Teachers Start Teaching at the Door. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that kids come at the door and I start handing out papers and I start telling them what the lesson is going to be about? No, it does not mean that at all. Okay. Let me repeat something that I said a few minutes ago. I learned this as an educational proverb, if you can reach them, you can teach them. And on the first day of school, the first thing I did was to reach out to kids. And I didn't reach out just mentally. I reached out physically. Literally, I reached out to them. I greeted every one of my students every day, every period. I taught five classes a day. I individually greeted them at the doorway and welcomed them into my classroom the same way that I would welcome a friend into my home. And that was one of the most important things for me to do is to make them feel that they were significant, to make them feel that they counted, to make them feel that I was glad to see them, and to make them feel welcome in my classroom. Now, I do need to give you a little bit of history of this because if you've never done this before, I want to give you fair warning about what's going to happen on the first day. All right? Welcoming them at the door, what happens the first day? I'm going to do a little demonstration, okay? Let's say the hallway that the kids come down towards my class is right here. And the doorway is right here. So they're going to come walking down here. They're going to turn right, and they're going to go in the room. Okay, I position myself right here in the doorway. So they're coming down the hallway. And I th thought, this was my second year of teaching. I didn't do it in my first year. And I decided I want to get to know my students much better now that I have a year of experience. <clears throat> and I thought they would be really happy that their teacher was going to greet them at the door. Well, I was very surprised and disappointed about what happened. But I learned something very valuable. Uh, I had 30 students in my class. And I want to explain what five of them did. Okay, they're coming down the hallway. They come down and they see me standing there so I, they know I'm the teacher. And they see me looking at them and they look back at me. And then they get a little closer and they see that I'm smiling at them. And they smile back at me. And then they get a little closer and they see that I've extended my hand. And they reach out and they take my hand and they give me a good firm handshake. And I say, good morning, I'm Mr. Urban. May I have your name, please? And they give me their name and I say, well, welcome to my classroom. And they go in. I thought they would all do that. How many did I say did it? Five. How many class in the class did I say? Thirty. What did the other 25 do? Or maybe I should say, what did they not do? Okay, here's what happened. Now, by the way, these students were in the 11th grade, so they've been in school for more than 10 years, all right? They come walking down, they see me, they know I'm the teacher, the head goes down. Okay, so they go like this, they get closer, I'm smiling at them, they don't see my smile because they're looking at the ground. Okay, then they get a little bit closer, and my hand is out there. Now, they're looking down, but they see that hand, and they have to decide, what am I going to do with that hand? Some of them act like they don't see it. They walk past me and they go like this into the classroom. Now, others are thinking, well, I can't be rude. I got to shake his hand. But they put something out there that feels more like a dead fish. 
than a hand. Okay, and then I, when I say good morning, I'm Mr. Urban, may I have your name? They mumble. Your kids ever mumble? Somebody's got to teach them to not mumble, right? Because we're talking about social skills here. So anyway, 25 of them did this, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to stand here every day and have this happen? It was very discouraging. And I thought, now I need to talk to the kids about it and help them understand why I was at the door, but also set it up so this won't happen over and over and over again. And again, I don't want to make them feel stupid or anything like that. But so I got a chance to think about what I was going to say while they were coming in. And so the bell rang. I went up to the front of the classroom and I said, welcome back, everybody. Uh, made sure we found out if anybody was new to the school. And then I said, uh, we're going to start the school year with a very simple question. How many of you noticed where I was when you came in the classroom today? Now, every single one of them knew where I was. I was standing at the door. So some kid raises his hand. He said, Mr. Urban, you were standing in the doorway. And I said, why do you think I was in the doorway? And the answer was always the same. You were probably there because it's the first day of school and you wanted to welcome us back. And I said, that's a good answer because it is the first day of school and I do want to welcome you back. I said, but you know, I get the feeling I caught a bunch of you off guard today. And I said, I want to apologize if I made you feel uncomfortable. I said, let's talk about what happened there. And so we, we started talking about it. And I said, did some of you feel uncomfortable? And they were nodding their head yes. And I said, could you tell me why? And they said they'd been going to school for 11 years and that they had never been greeted at the door by a teacher before. Not ever. And it threw them off. And then they said, besides that, you're the biggest teacher we've ever had. <laughs> okay, so between the two of them, it made them feel uncomfortable. And I said, I said, well, I'm sorry about that. I said, but I'm going to write a letter to your parents in a couple of days, and I'm going to tell them that I teach academic subjects, I teach life lessons, and I teach social skills. And I said, I think it's really important for all of us to be able to communicate effectively with other people and to develop the best social skills we can because it's going to take us a long way in, uh, in life. So that's what happened. So I went up to the chalkboard, and I wrote... Uh, these four things on the board, make eye contact, smile, speak clearly, and give a firm handshake. And for a reason that I don't know, a lot of parents are not teaching those social skills to kids anymore. And um, I asked my kids, I said, how many of you were taught these by your parents? And almost all of them raised their hand, but they didn't do that that first day. And I said, well, what happened? How, how come you didn't do it? with me if you were taught that by your parents. And some kids said to me, I didn't think they applied at school. <laughs> well, what, you know what that tells us? That tells us that kids don't see school and real life connected. And I think we have an obligation as much as possible to connect school and real life. And that, that uh, social skills is a big uh, important part of that. So what happened the second day? It was completely different. The kids knew I was going to be there. They did make an effort to look me in the eye. They made an effort to smile. They shook my hand firmly and uh, uh, we had a little verbal exchange. Good morning. How are you? And so on. And it was completely different. Now the beauty of doing this is that every time you do it, because you do it every day, it has a build-up effect. You feel like you know those kids and you're a little more connected to them each time that you make that daily connection at the door. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, kids have a lot of energy. One of the things that I loved about greeting them at the door is because they had a lot of energy, they energized me. And I used to tell the kids, I said, I'm like a rechargeable battery standing at the door and if I get 30 positive charges at the door, I will be a better teacher on that day. And I always felt that way. I wrote in the book, I said, this was the, the easiest thing I ever did as a teacher. It was the least time consuming. It was only five minutes. Uh, it was the most fun. Uh, and it was the most important thing that, that I did. And my kids got, 
students got very used to it and uh, they would uh, get upset if for some reason I was not at the door, like say I had to run to the bathroom or something, and they would wait at the door until I got back to make sure that they got their, uh, they got their greeting. I remember one time I, I went to, out to greet the students and my telephone rang and it was at the other end of the room and I went over and I picked up the, the telephone and, and I wanted to get off the phone as fast as I could so I could greet the students that were coming in. And, and I said, hello. And one girl had come to the door and she saw me on the phone and she wasn't going to come in until I got off the phone and she went <laughs> like this, like I'm waiting. And I said, I'm sorry, I have, I'll have to call you back. Boom, I got off and I went to greet her uh, at the door. Okay, now, I did this in my second year of teaching, and I only made one change in this procedure in the whole time that I did it. And I want to explain the change to you. Uh, Now I've been a teacher for a year and a half, and one of the things I notice as I walk around school is that kids have very informal ways of greeting each other. When they greet each other, they do not walk up to their best friend and shake hands with them. Okay, what they do is if it's, uh, well, the boys have one set of greeting rituals and the girls have another set of greeting rituals. The one I like best from the girls, if they haven't seen each other for 10 minutes, they go, ah, like this. They get all excited and they're genuinely happy to see each other because they're more sociable than boys are at that age. But anyway, the boys, uh, they high five, they low five, they go like this. They go like this to each other, um, do all kinds of crazy things. The girls, they, they hug each other. They uh, sometimes walk hand in hand and, uh, again, show more excitement about seeing each other. So I watch all of these things, and I'm thinking, maybe the kids would like to greet me in a more informal way instead of shaking my hand. So I figured, okay, I'll give them, I'll give them an option. <clears throat> So I told them at the beginning of the second semester, now keep in mind, I've already greeted these kids 90 times, 9-0. That's halfway through the school year. We have 180 days in the school year. So I know them really well. And I said, you know, I, I watch you guys greet kids, greet each other around the campus. And I said, so let's try something. I said, in the daily greeting, there are going to be three minimum requirements. And that is you make eye contact with me, you smile and you speak clearly. I said, but there's gonna be one option, and that is the greeting itself. I said, now the option is yours, not mine. It says, you choose whatever way you wanna greet me, and I will return that greeting in the same way. I said, now don't do anything you're not comfortable with. If you think it's best and most comfortable to continue to shake my hand, then do that. But if you want a high five, I said, I can do it one-handed, two-handed, cross-handed, up, down. I I said, I'll do it with you. I said, if you need a hug, I'll give you one. So I didn't know what was going to happen. They come in the next day. The energy level was even higher. The smiles were bigger. They thought it was fun that they could greet their teacher any way they wanted to. And I got all of those greetings. What I was particularly happy about was I had about... 150 students, I probably got about 80 or 90 hugs that day. And I remember as, as, it, you know, as it went along, then the number of hugs increases. And, and uh, people used to ask me, well, what do you like most about teaching? And I said, how many people can go to work every day and get about 100 hugs? You know, and it was fantastic. Uh, people asked me, did you ever get any complaints? And I said, no, I never got any complaints because it was their choice. And all I did was hug them back. We used to have a thing, uh, well, they still have it. They call it back-to-school night. Do you have that here? It's where the parents come, and they go from class to class just like their kids do. And so I stood outside the door on the night the parents came, and and I greeted them, and and they would say, do we get a hug? And I said, sure, it's a great way to meet people. Okay. So anyway, that's what I did for the rest of my career, and it was absolutely uh, fabulous. That's probably the thing I miss the most about daily contact with, uh, with kids. I, I go out and speak to kids a lot, and sometimes I tell them, I said, you know, I was a teacher for a long time, and I, 
and I loved kids, and, and I said a lot of them always hugged me at the door before I started teaching. Would any of you like to give me a hug? And I'm a complete stranger, and they'll get up out of their seat and come up and give me a big hug before I even start speaking. And I say, good, that energized me. I'll be a better speaker today. Okay, so anyway, that whole thing took about 10 minutes. Okay, I greeted them at the door, and then we discussed this for about 10 minutes in the class, and we're off to a good start. Now, the class is 50 minutes long, I spent the next 40 minutes talking about manners and the golden rule. Now, I'm not talking about rules and do's and don'ts and those types of things now. I'm talking about the way we're going to treat each other in the class. Not, not the way the students are going to treat me, the way we're all going to treat each other. Now, this has a different history to it. I did not start doing this in my second year of teaching. I started teaching in 1965. I did not do this until the 1980s. It's a very simple reason. Back in the 1960s and 70s, the kids were so polite that it would have been a waste of time for me to talk about manners. They were respectful. They, uh, we had a strict dress code. We had a strict behavior code. They behaved extremely well. And there was no reason for me to talk about manners. But things have changed, haven't they? Not, not only in our country, but in other countries, because I do visit a lot of them, and they tell me things have changed. Okay, again, Horace Mann, the father of public education in the United States, says manners easily and rapidly mature into morals. Now, question, have manners and morals declined since the 1980s? The answer is yes, isn't it? Okay, it's a, certainly uh, a lot in, in the United States. Okay, a uh, couple of signs of the times. One of our weekly news magazines is called U.S. News and World Report. And U.S. News and World Report did a 20-page cover story a few years ago on manners. And the title, as you see, was called, In Your Face, Whatever Happened to Good Manners? Why Don't We Treat Each Other with Mutual Respect Anymore? Uh, another magazine that I've been reading for many, many years is Time Magazine. And they did a cover story just on filthy language. It's called Dirty Words, America's Foul-Mouthed pop culture. Yes, manners and morals have declined significantly since the 1980s. So what do we do about it? Okay, here's a question. Do kids do rude things? Yes. Do adults do rude things? Yes. Okay, now, but we're dealing mostly with kids, right? So what can we do to help them? They do rude things. But that's not the most important question about their manners. This is the most important question. Do they know they're being rude? And the answer is about 95% of the time, no, they don't know they're being rude. Times have changed. They do what they see on television. They do what they see in movies. They do what their friends are doing. They're very influenced by uh, the media and, and celebrities, how celebrities behave. All right, now let me just give you a brief example how things used to be and how they are today. The 1960s and 70s. Let me give you a specific example that happened every day. I was what you call, as a high school teacher, I was a handout teacher. I preferred to give my own handouts rather than use a textbook. I did not like textbooks. Kid, that was good for the kids because they hated textbooks too. And I said, I hate them more than you do. Uh, because in my subject areas, there were never any good ones that, that could interest the kids or me. Okay, so over the years, I developed all my own materials, and I numbered the pages. And so let's say at the beginning of class, I say, would you please open your binder and turn to the last page I gave, which was page 14. So they do that, and a student was absent yesterday, and he realizes he doesn't have page 14. So this is what he does. He raises his hand. And I call on him, and I say, Jimmy, what can I do for you? And he said, Mr. Urban, I was absent yesterday. He said, I'm missing page 14. May I please have that? And I said, you sure can. And I took it out, and I handed it to him. And he said, thank you, Mr. Urban. And I said, you're welcome. Now, you know what we call that exchange? We call that common courtesy. That's the way it used to be all of the time. That is not what is happening in classrooms today. <clears throat> 1980s into the 2000s. I need. In other words, if the same exchange happened, the kid would not raise his hand. 
He would not say, may I please have, he would say, I need page 14. <laughs> it's disrespectful, it's demanding, and it's demeaning to me as a professional. I don't want my kids to treat me that way because I don't want them to get used to treating other people that way. One of the sad things about this, you know where they learn to say, I need, at home. And you know what happens when they say, I need, at home? They get what they need. But they're not going to do that in my classroom. I have an obligation to them to teach them to have good social skills, and that includes good manners. Okay, that's a common one. Now, 60s and 70s. I developed a very simple technique, and I would advise all teachers to uh, develop something similar to this as a way of putting out fires. Now, Dr. Jones earlier spoke about, remember he said what usually happens, kids are, he used the expression goofing off, you remember that? Okay, or fooling around or whatever, and that's usually what it is. It's, it's friends, I'm going to talk later about how I arrange the seating uh, in my glass, classroom, I was glad that he talked about that. But um, it, it's usually some kids, quote, goofing off. And in probably in my first year of teaching, I would fall into the trap of I'm teaching, and there's two kids over here goofing off, and I would look at them and I'd say, hey, what are you doing? That's not a good way to deal with it. Raising your voice is rarely effective. Sometimes it is, but rarely. And singling out kids and embarrassing them in front of their peers not effective. So I realized there was a better way of doing it. You know, I, uh, I played a lot of basketball and I also coached basketball in high school. And one of the things that I realized when the game is going on and something's going wrong with my team and we need to regroup, I can stop the entire game without saying a word. You know how I do that? I just go like this. And the game stops. Somebody sees it, the referee blows his whistle, the game stops. I bring my players over and I say, okay, we got to make some adjustments. I start doing that in the classroom. I told the kids, if somebody is doing something they're not supposed to be doing, I said, I'm just going to stop teaching and I'm going to go like this. And I said, then I'm going to look at you. And that means you're the cause of the timeout. And you have two obligations, do them fast so we don't waste a lot of time and you don't get yelled at. First obligation is to stop what you're doing. Stop goofing off. Number two, say you're sorry. And so they would look at me and they go, oh, sorry, Mr. Urban. I say, fine, apology accepted. Go right back into class. Nobody gets yelled at. Nobody gets in trouble. Nobody gets sent to the office. It worked wonderfully for years and years until about the 1980s. Too many timeouts. Man, I kept calling timeouts, but it wasn't they would look up at me and go, oh, sorry. They would look at me and they'd go, what? <laughs> they didn't even know what they were doing was not okay. That's what I mean by kids do rude things. They don't even know that they're being rude. And so uh, I figured I have to make some adjustments here. Times have changed. I've got to change with them. I saw enormous changes in my 36 years of teaching. But you've got to go with the times. You've got to adjust to the times. Okay, how did I solve the problem? I drew on my education. All right. Uh, one of my favorite teachers at the University of San Francisco was a, was a man named Dr. Ralph Lane. He was a sociology professor. And I didn't know what sociology was, but a bunch of my classmates said, oh, you've got to take sociology. It's really interesting, and Dr. Lane is a fabulous teacher. So I signed up for it, and he came out on the first day, and he said, how many of you know what sociology is? And not very many of us did. So he said, well, let's start with principle number one of sociology. It's the heart of the whole thing, and everything comes from it. People behave as they're expected to behave. That's principle number one of sociology. Now, apply this to my classroom. When kids come into my classroom on the first day, do they know what my expectations of their behavior? No, they used to back in the 1960s and 70s, but they didn't when things began to change in the 1980s. They did not know what my expectations were. So that's my first obligation is to make sure that they know what those expectations are. And again, I'm not going to do it in an angry, mean, punitive way. I'm going to do it in a way that they understand we're all better off when we do this. <coughs> Okay, I want to share two old expressions with you. 
In my second year of teaching, um, a legendary teacher in our district who had won a lot of teaching awards <coughs> and was an expert on classroom management did a workshop for the, for the first and second year teachers on classroom management. And he started it by going to the chalkboard and writing these words, what you accept, you teach. And I had no idea what he meant. So he said, I learned this when I started teaching back in the 1930s. He said, and I didn't know what it meant either, so let me explain to you what it means. If a child in one of your classes does something that's against the rules, does something that's mean-spirited to another kid, or does something that's uh, <clears throat> just plain rude, and you don't deal with it, because you want to don't want to waste any time and you want to get on with your lesson or you don't want to have a confrontation with a kid and so you just want to kind of ignore that thing that's a big mistake you must deal with it right now now how you deal with it is important but you must deal with it immediately because what you accept you teach in other words if you let the kid get away with something let's say some kid says something really mean to another kid and you go on with your lesson. Okay, you have accepted that behavior. And in accepting it, you, have, you are now teaching it. You are teaching that student and the rest of the students, this is acceptable behavior in my class. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, you deal with it immediately. What you accept, you teach. Now there's another one here. It means exactly the same thing. What you permit, you promote. Because if they see you can do this in your class, then somebody else is going to do it too, and you have promoted it. All right. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, written by Stephen Covey. Dr. Covey died uh, about a year ago. Uh, he was a wonderful man. Uh, he took time from his busy schedule to endorse two of my books. I will forever be grateful uh, for him for doing that. But uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People has sold about 12 million copies. I wish I would have written that book. I'd, I'd like to sell 12 million copies. But anyway, uh, habit number one is be proactive. And what that means is take a step up front before something happens instead of waiting until it happens. That's called reactive. Somebody does something wrong and then you react to it. He said maybe you can head off that wrong behavior by being proactive, addressing the issue before it happens. All right, so that's number one. Now another one of his seven habits, now, I don't know if I lost my battery or what here. Um, okay, what happened? Uh, technical glitches, aren't they wonderful? Um, yeah, I don't, is anybody back there, you think they uh, could help me out here on this? I, I'm not too sure why it's um, not going forward. Yeah, even, even if I try to do it manually, I'm not, uh, not getting it. Yeah. Huh. Where is, uh, Kathy, I don't know if you can help me or not. Notice when I hit this, it, it's, it goes red. Oh, yeah, but see, even when I try to go forward here, it's not. You wanna, it starts to be able to charge. No, I don't think so. I've never had that happen before. Okay, now is this, will this one work? Give that lady a hand. She's, my hero. I don't, I don't know what happened. But <clears throat> anyway, the other, another one of the seven habits is always think win-win. Everybody wins. Okay, when your students have good manners and they treat each other with mutual respect, everybody wins. So be proactive and always think win-win. So this is the way I tried to sell this idea to the kids, we all win. We create a better atmosphere uh, in the classroom. Okay, making expectations known. My first handout of the year was entitled, Whatever Happened to Good Manners? 
There's a copy of this page in the book. And it says at the top, it gives a quotation about the importance of good manners. And then it lists uh, a number of behaviors. This is what kids used to do, and this is what they're doing today. And there's a big list of them. And down, down, down at the bottom, there were some discussion questions. And so we spent the rest of the class talking about those things. And I wasn't sure how the kids were going to respond. These were seniors in high school, 12th graders. And I wasn't too sure how they were going to respond. I wondered if they might say, why are we doing this? Why are you treating us like third graders? None of them said that. They all thanked me for doing this. They said, Mr. Urban, so many rude things go on in other classrooms, and the teachers never do anything about it. We're so glad that you addressed the issue because now we know what's expected of us in your class. And so I did that for the rest of my teaching career. And again, if I did it in the proper way, it would create the, the good environment. So between the greeting at the door and, and doing this, uh, we got off to a really good start of the, of the year. Now, there is one other thing that I taught them on day one. I'm sure you have been taught this before, and all I'm going to do here today is reinforce it. I'm going to remind you. As teachers and parents, we need to always be aware that we use three methods of communication whenever we talk face-to-face -face with another person. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Three ways we communicate. I'm using all three of them in this presentation, and I'm not even talking about the slides. All right, here are the three. I know you know them. Words. Since I've started talking, literally hundreds of words have come out of my mouth. But we sometimes think that that's the only way we're communicating is using our words. But there are two other things going on. One is body language. Body language means your facial expression, what you do with your posture, your movement, everything. From up here to tips of your toes. And your tone of voice is also important. And sometimes your body language and your tone of voice are more important than the words you use. We want to say things in a nice way, the best way we can. And I used to teach my students that. I said, people pick up signals from you, and you can be very rude in your body language. All right? You can be very polite in your body language. All right, now let me tell you a little story. It's actually one of my favorites, and I'll try to make it brief. But at the high school that I uh, taught at, <clears throat> it's called Woodside High School. Let me tell you where it's located. We're about 25 minutes south of San Francisco, one of the most beautiful cities in the world and a wonderful place to live. We're about three miles north of Stanford University, one of the great universities of the world. And so a lot of exchange students from different parts of the world, they want to come to the United States for a year, and they hear about Woodside High School, and so they want to go there. And we had kids from Asia. We had kids from Latin America. We had kids from Europe. And they were fantastic. Uh, they were always very polite. They all came to us with very good English, and they all really wanted to make the most out of the year in the United States. Well, one year... I got a young boy from Germany. His name was Henning Ostmann. And he, when we started the school year, he was not in my class. He was, um, uh, he was in somebody else's class. And then at the semester time, his counselor said, Henning, in order for you to take all the subjects you need to take, you have to change your schedule. And he was in this other teacher's United States history class. So he had to take the second half of U.S. history, but he couldn't stay in that class, so he ended up in my class, which was the third period of the day. And so he came and he walked up and introduced himself on the first day, and he was very polite, and, and he said something very complimentary to me. He said, oh, Mr. Urban, I'm so glad to be here. He said, I've heard wonderful things about you. Well, we got off to a very good start, right? Okay, and I said to him, I said, well, that's great. I've heard good things about you. And, and I said, I hope we can both live up to those expectations. So he came into the class. I introduced him to his classmates. And I said, you'll get to know everybody uh, very quickly. And, uh, and, I, and I said, welcome. And so he's in my class Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, after, after class is over, the bell rings and the kids go to lunch. So on Thursday, the bell rang. The kids zoomed out to go to lunch and he didn't leave. And so I looked at him and I said, Henning, aren't you going to lunch? And he said, oh, 
He said, Mr. Urban, I'm going to lunch. He, he said, but I've been in your class for four days now, and I've been thinking about this all four days, and I want to share it with you. And he's always very positive, very upbeat. And so I said, okay, what, what is it, Henning? And he goes like this. He has a big smile on his face, and he says, Mr. Urban, he said, I just want to tell you, I think you are a very lucky teacher. Well, I wasn't too sure what he meant. And I said, well, Henning, I am a lucky teacher. I, I said, I found my calling early in life. I knew at a young age I wanted to be a teacher. And I said, is that why I'm lucky? Because I found my calling. And, and he said, oh, no, no, that's not the reason. And I said, well, this is a very good school, and I feel very fortunate to be on the faculty here. I said, is that what you mean? He said, oh, no, 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 Mr. Urban, that's not why you're lucky. And I said, well, Henning, you're going to have to tell me why I'm lucky. And he goes, okay, Mr. Urban, let me put it this way. And he goes like this. He holds up his hands, five fingers here, one finger here, and he says, Mr. Urban, I take six classes at this school. He said, and the students in third period U.S. history are by far the most polite of any of those students. He said, Mr. Urban, you are very lucky to have such polite students in your third period class. And I said to him, I said, I agree. And they were wonderful kids. And, and I said, they, they are very polite. I said, but Henning, look here. And I held up one hand and I said, I teach five classes every day and all of my students are polite. And he goes, whoa, you are luckier than I thought you were. He said, how does that happen? How do you get all the polite ones? And I said, Henning, what did your teachers do on the first day of school? And he told me what they did. That's how I know. They did the things that I talked about earlier. And I said, well, we did something different. I said, we were talking about social skills and the golden rule and manners and things like that. And we were developing a community in our classroom. And he says, oh, he said, that's amazing. He said, and I told him I gave a handout. And he said, could I see the handout? And I said, sure. So I went and got a copy and I showed it to him and he, he studied it for a while. And, and then he says, oh, Mr. Urban, I've got a great idea for you. And I said, what's that? And he said, you get all those teachers up there in that multi-use room and you teach them how to teach manners to kids. <laughs> the problem is I wouldn't be able to do that, would I? You think my the own teachers on my own faculty are going to listen to me? No. No, there's a... There's a thing in the Bible that says the teacher is without honor in his own land. Okay? You ever seen the definition of an expert? Somebody who goes out of state to speak. And in this case, out of the country. So the farther you go away, the bigger expert you are. Fred and I are really big experts in the Philippines. Okay. All right. So anyway, that's my story. Now, I think we're supposed to take a break here somewhere, aren't we? Yeah, let's take about a 20-minute break, and then I'll uh, finish up with you for today, all right? Enjoy your break. <laughs>